and welcome back to Eurejana 120. I am Jeff Cliff, and this is a series of 120 videos of things that I learned as a student at the University of Regina as part of a computer science uh, degree. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about uh, the, I guess, father of modern science, uh, Democritus, uh, if I'm pronouncing that right, or Democritus. Uh, and, but before I want to get into that, I just want to point out there was an error in the video on Aristotle. So if you go back and you watch the video on Aristotle, uh, I, there was a slight discrepancy uh, in, uh, prob I probably wrote it down from some incorrect source somewhere, I don't remember where. Uh, but I, I did point out that he was the origin of the four elements idea, and that is in fact incorrect. Uh, the discovery of error was by one Empedocles, if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, and he gave Aristotle the idea of four elements existing. Up until Empedocles, which was not all that long before Aristotle, would have been probably a contemporary or kind of early contemporary Socrates, which we'll get into later, uh, he uh, discovered air and so ha came up with kind of the fourth element so that there could be understood the four elements. However, by Aristotle's time, or Empedocles, uh, again if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, his four element idea was scientific, uh, or at least what would have passed for uh, scientific knowledge at the time. So regardless of who kind of originated that, it was an ancient Greek uh, who was trying to understand the cosmos in regards to how it could be constructed. And so uh, it was just a, again, a man who came up with that as a way to explain the things that he saw. It wasn't some kind of a mystical thing that has been kind of passed down uh, from people who got it from the gods or something. This is something that was the best uh, informed guess based on experiment and the understanding at the time. We have a much better understanding now. So now that that is kind of out of the way, uh, you, e even with Empedocles' kind of experiment of uh, kind of detecting that there is this air here, uh, but you, you could even kind of visualize it I as follows, even if you don't use his particular experiment, uh, which is that you're not feeling good. And so you have kind of a, a, a deep uh, breath of fresh air. So, you know, you don't, you don't feel good inside, and you step outside, you take a deep breath, and you start to feel a little bit better. And so there has to be something out there, in the air, that is out there, uh, that you took into yourself as, as breathing. Uh, there's something out there, and so uh, there, there is, it's, you know, you, you can kind of watch your breathing and discover it that way, but regardless of what is made out of, um, it's, there's just something out there to, to see, to breathe, to understand. And uh, before we get too much deeper into kind of how Demar Democritus would have seen this, uh, it's also worth pointing out that it's hard to disambiguate what was Democritus's ideas and what were the ideas of his mentor, Lucifus? Again, if I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, because Lucifus wrote uh, a book, uh, quote, The Greater World System, uh, which, again, kind of follows along the kind of path of uh, Isaac Newton and his system of the world, uh, and the kind of system of the mathematics uh, that has kind of um, been thought of as the kind of governing idea for all of science uh, in, in later uh, works and ideas, uh, but just to kind of give a clue of what they're trying to do, what, what they're trying to view, uh, what they're doing is about, and the greater world system is probably a good way of describing it. But Democritus himself actually wrote a, a companion book to it called The Little World System. Now, I haven't read either of these two books, but it's just, again, to give kind of an, a clue of where we're going with this, is this system of the world, of understanding things, without appealing to the old way of viewing the system of the world existing in his time. So Democritus's father was wealthy enough uh, when he was young to receive Xerxes uh, uh, on his march. Uh, and that is, of course, the you know, kind of demigod-like figure in the fictional work 300. Uh, but that was based on a real event. There was a real guy uh, who commanded a large army that ended up being you know, stopped by those 300 Spartans or whatever. Uh, but that guy stopped by uh, Democritus' town, uh, and so that town would have been kind of on the borderland between these kind of two, or large empire and this, you know, kind of federation of city-states and democracies. Uh, and uh, so his father would have been a wealthy person in that kind of borderland area, 
and Xerxes may or may not have left behind some of his magicians and wizards. See the alchemy video for kind of more details on what that entailed, uh, but which Democritus may or may not have learned from. So there's a little bit of kind of ambiguity in history because we don't know for sure either way. But that that's kind of the rumor of what exactly happened there uh, is that there's you know certainly he would have passed through with his learned men and with the knowledge all the knowledge that had been conquered by his armies uh, that you know they didn't burn to the ground or whatever uh, you know the the smart people who were left certainly knew how to do a lot of things they knew a lot about math or mathematics and geography and science at least as it was understood in his time which wasn't all that much uh, and so he from either that point or from earlier who knows uh, he was kind of a you know very uh, industrious guy he quote lived exclusively for his studies uh, he was shy enough that even though he came to Athens while Socrates was still alive uh, and he was even kind of as an important enough figure by that point that he could have easily came up to Socrates and just started talking to him and it would have been appropriate for him to do so he was too shy to actually do it and so this is you know you, you can kind of imagine this guy who's uh, kind of a very very interested in the world very interested in learning uh, has ended up spending most of his father's inheritance uh, on traveling and learning and acquiring books and that sort of thing so uh, he's, he's kind of brought a lot of the world's knowledge into himself um, and he tried to kind of organize that knowledge again in, in his book the little world system and in others uh, and uh, he would have viewed things not split between the STEM, uh, kind of the sciences, and the social sciences and the humanities. Uh, he, even by that point, the, those two things were starting to branch off a little bit, but he didn't view them that way. He, he would have said something like, quote, man is a microcosm, a little cosmos. So, like, the, the idea that there's this universe out here the, in the sky and the, the earth around us and all these physical processes that are governing everything that we see around us, and yet man is a microcosm of that, and that everything we can learn about the universe outside of ourselves, there's something inherent in us that can be understood with that knowledge, uh, and we'll get into more details of that as we go. Uh, but he established things like uh, aesthetics, uh, yeah, the study of aesthetics is something that people study. That there isn't just, oh, this looks good, and then that's the end of it. He actually kind of started to probe for why certain things uh, are worth, you know, appearing in a certain way. He also would have dissected human beings and sort of brought the idea of, of by, or science to how exactly do human organs work uh, and started the first kind of steps towards understanding that. So up until him, uh, the ancient Greeks uh, were, of course, very religious, and they would have asked all sorts of questions and come up with all sorts of answers based and informed on their particular religious beliefs. And in particular, the Milky Way, the kind of band of stars in the sky, if you can live somewhere or go, go in the prairie somewhere, look up at the sky in the middle of the night, and on a clear day, you'll see it, kind of clear as night, uh, and there's this big band of stars, and they, the Greeks would have saw that. Uh, and interpreted that as the milk of the goddess Hera's breast squirted across the sky. No, really. That, that's what the, the religion at the time actually thought. Uh, and as ridiculous as that sounds now, it was the persuasive argument that everyone kind of nodded their head and said, oh, yeah, okay, well, I guess so. Uh, but Democritus, instead of just kind of accepting that, uh, made other guesses, and in particular that the Milky Way were stars like the Sun, and was the first to suppose that some of those stars in the Milky Way may have planets like the Earth, which is round, uh, circling around it, at least some of them, maybe not all of them, uh, and that some of those planets may even harbor life, and so even if some don't, that there's this kind of universe of stars with planets surrounding them at least extending as far as the Milky Way. Um, and given that there are what, billions and billions or billions of billions of stars in the Milky Way, uh, you can kind of imagine how big the universe would seem to him, even if he didn't have a complete count of all the stars in the Milky Way. And of course, you, you can kind of think back that, well, Democritus was quite a bit before, uh, for example, uh, 1491, uh, and uh, Columbus's, uh, or, or even Lee Erickson's kind of trip across the Atlantic. So there, something happened here that 
cause us to kind of forget or to, as a species, no longer believe that the Earth was round, that the stars also had things kind of orbiting them, or that orbiting was even a thing. Uh, the, these ideas kind of got lost on us. So he was kind of ahead of the curve by well over a thousand years on kind of astronomical ideas and the understanding of the universe. Aristotle in particular, uh, going back to the Aristotle video, uh, believed that Democritus was incorrect on that, uh, and that the Milky Way was just on the top of the atmosphere, uh, and that you could kind of theoretically even test uh, and go up to the top of the atmosphere and disprove Democritus. Um, that test was not conducted, uh, and couldn't be conducted for another at least thousand years for the hot air balloon to be invented. So th these were these two kind of competing ideas uh, between Democritus and Aristotle uh, and others who kind of followed one or the other to greater or lesser degrees kind of persisted for quite some time because there was no way to test it, no way to verify that there's, you know, the top of the atmosphere isn't just covered in these, you know, things that shine uh, in the right way that we would see it. And if you look into the clouds, it is kind of hard to get a sense of scale. You know, it could be extremely large clouds, or they could be just very small uh, and you know, relatively close to us. It's, it's hard to get, when you start dealing with things that are so far away that you can't interact with them, a grasp of scale without standard candles, without other things that were invented, th again, thousands of years later. So Democritus is doing pretty good considering what he's working with. To give an idea of how he would have approached problems, uh, let's look at the conic section, which is something that if, if you know, you've taken uh, geometry or algebra in high school, uh, you've probably encountered. So the idea behind a conic section is that you draw two lines, and then those two lines define a cone on both sides. And then you split one of these two cones with a plane, i.e. a kind of like a piece of paper or something. So that, uh, and depending what angle you cut these cones at, will determine what shape you have cut. So in this case, I think this is a parabola. But you can cut lines, ellipses, hyperbola, uh, and kind of conic section-like curves like that. And so a particular kind of cut that you could make, and if you're just kind of imagining this as kind of like an hourglass or something, you can ab absolutely do this in practice. is you put this conic section on a table or something. So this is a right angle here. The, the conic section is right on that table, and so this is flat. Uh, and then what you do is parallel to this table, you make another cut. And so his point was, if we kind of zoom in here and look at the two sides of where we just made that cut, they're going to be circles. And his argument was, is that, well, the problem here is that these two circles can't be equal in size. Because if they were equal in size, then this is no longer a cone. This should be a cylinder, because we're not gaining or losing anything as we go, kind of go up this this side here. And if, if that's the case, well, that's fine. We just cut a cylinder. But we wanted to cut a cone, so we cut this cone. So one of these two circles should be smaller, slight, ever so smaller than the first, or than the bottom. So you get the bottom, the top, and there's this just little tiny difference between these two that kind of cause this to be a uh, slope line rather than a vertical line. And so that was his argument, that there is this just difference. And so the difference between the two, you could reason, is about the size of the indivisible 
uh, kind of property of nature that keeps lines or uh, physical objects uh, such that you can make uh, sloped curves and cut them. So that there are these, I guess, individual, uh, indivisible parts of nature, or regardless of how big they are, that keep you from having two circles cut in this way, being the exact same size. That there is this thing, there, this property of the universe that kind of keeps it this way, which is kind of worth thinking about. And that if you view things this way, then the cone isn't actually just comprised of two straight lines, but it's actually going to be comprised of these kind of little jagged lines. Kind of like you'd see on a computer screen, if you zoom in enough on a line on a computer screen. And that this is actually what lines look like as the universe implements. So maybe there's this idea of a line that's perfectly straight, but when you actually build something, and you put something together in, in, in practice, that this is actually what it's going to look like. Uh, or perhaps there's something kind of that looks kind of like a jagged line that will allow you to build a line in a similar way. Around or, or a little bit before his time, uh, Parmenides uh, thought that all of matter and all of the universe was one thing and that there could be no movement that was logically possible because there's this one thing that existed in that, you know, change was an illusion, there was only permanence, uh, and that there is this, this thing that looks like it's changing, but it's actually being the same the whole time. Uh, and it was kind of an open challenge to philosophers in his day to explain movement, a challenge that realistically remained open until Isaac Newton uh, and Leibniz uh, kind of clarified uh, the idea, and even possibly until Bayes kind of clarified what Isaac Newton meant. Uh, in such a way that it became mathematically rigorous. So up until, again, you know, thousands of years later, there's this kind of open challenge to describe the math and the, the details of change. And, and the beginning of that was really about uh, Parmenides and Democritus' time. They were asking the right questions. They weren't getting very good answers. Uh, Democritus himself would have been aware of Zeno's paradoxes. And his solution to them was a lower level of division. Uh, so that there's this kind of step function in regards to curves that kind of made the math that work. It wasn't a very good answer, uh, but his answers were would have at least kind of dealt with the, an the question. And he was kind of asking the right questions, coming up with sensible answers, maybe if not the correct ones. Uh, he would have said something like, quote, nothing exists except atoms and empty space. Everything else is opinion. And so this is, of course, where we're going with it that yes, there's this step function, or this kind of stepping ladder of sorts, but the, the steps are composed of these indivisible things, these atoms, which is, of course, a how we would see it today, in terms of if we were to actually build an hourglass out of glass atoms, that you would actually have at the kind of border of between the glass and the air outside of it, this kind of stepping of these physical things that look, at when you zoom in enough, kind of like a ladder, or, or you know, something that could be cut, so that on one end it's a little bit bigger than on the other. So that's exactly what Democritus would have supposed to be the case. Uh, and so he would have viewed things in terms of this world of atoms. Instead of looking for uh, a, a final cause, a prime mover, uh, a purpose for everything, uh, defined especially in terms of religious cause and effect, he would view things in terms of their components, their atoms. You know, if you take, you go to Tear Down Tuesday, you take apart the computer, you take apart the components of the computer, you smash the capacitors, you take the paper inside the capacitors, zoom in with a microscope, kind of tear it apart, keep tearing it apart, eventually you get to these little things. These little things that the universe is, or the matter in the universe is made of. And he would have originated uh, certainly a view of the universe in that frame. And he would have viewed these atoms as too small to be seen, but giving the perception of things that we can see, like color, like taste, like smell, like sound. All of these things he would have interpreted in terms of the movement and characteristics of these atoms. The Aristotelians would have viewed this as reducing all change to a change of place. So again, they're kind of reinterpreting what changes and what doesn't. So yes, there are these atoms that are permanent, 
in his mind and that are indivisible or, or at least uh, kind of a permanent fixture of how the universe works. But the change is that they're not always in the same place. And so they kind of move around and amongst each other and create with that everything that we see. And so the, the atom kind of represents the infinity of the very small, this kind of thing that is so small that it's out of our picture and that you can only really come up with an informal definition of what it is and how it works with something like mathematical induction to, it, to get you there. A as kind of mentioned, he didn't believe that these atoms could be split and that there was any internal structure to these atoms and that the atoms were completely solid. We know that this is false, uh, but it's a pretty good first approximation of how they work. Uh, and so the fact that he was able to get that far thousands of years before we were able to verify one way or the other was a pretty good start. Uh, for example, neutrons were discovered in the 1930s. That's an internal structure. Uh, and, I mean, 1930s, well, well, well after the uh, uh, kind of pre-400 BC where this is happening. Uh, by the way, uh, the word atom, uh, if you go back to its Greek root, uh, atomos, uh, is a Greek word meaning or meaning uncuttable. So again, the idea of what we call atoms to this day dates to his kind of view of these things as these impenetrable, uncuttable kind of components of the universe. Uh, our language is a giveaway that he is the, one of the minds that has defined what the modern age is all about. And uh, strictly speaking, it's unclear whether it or not he believed that they couldn't be split. Uh, he may not have even come up with, you know, against the idea very much. Uh, it's, it's probably not all that mu much important either way, uh, given how far they were from being able to test it. Um, but it's also worth pointing out that uh, in the thousands of years since Democritus and Lucipius, uh, there were arguments back and forth about the nature and existence of atoms. And it's really only the 20th century that I, my parents' generation that we actually had direct evidence that atoms existed. Yes, there was the nuclear bomb. That was a pretty good uh, indication that we had the math right and the understanding of it. But even by 1945, there wasn't direct evidence of atoms specifically existing. There was evidence of atoms uh, behaving or matter behaving very much as if atoms existed. Uh, but it was, again, not, it was all indirect. Everything was, uh, kind of viewed in terms of the things you could observe. The heat from uh, neutron and uh, 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 alpha radiation emission, the, the kind of radiation itself you could detect with uh, um, Geiger counters. You, you could detect all these things about atoms, but you couldn't directly observe them until, again, my parents' generation. And if you go to Carl Sagan's Cosmos, uh, there's actually a clip of video of uranium atoms zoomed in by 100 million times. Uh, that you can actually see for yourself with your own eyes a video recording of the atoms themselves visually represented on your screen, uh, you know, recorded on video. Yes, you know, you have to go to the extent of finding somebody who's actually gone to the effort of taking that video. So it's not, you know, perhaps as direct as it could be. But again, this is something that in the 20th and 21st century we can now see for ourselves that he was right all along, that, that thousands of years of arguments back and forth, however justified they were, at the end of the day, his idea was correct. This is how the universe is structured. And indeed, there is void between atoms. So he would have uh, realized that even if uh, atoms existed, that there's the space in between them, and that space can be very large. He would have probably under how large that space between atoms actually is. Uh, but at the same time, he kind of had a sense of, or a scope of how, how big it was. So he, he was starting to get close to it, which isn't bad for kind of the originator of the idea. Um, and so he would have not viewed the, the void between atoms as nothing, uh, and that nothing you know can't exist or that doesn't exist or whatever. See again the video on equivocation for kind of discussions about the word nothing. Uh, but he would have run into that problem, and so he would have been kind of fighting against uh, uh, the idea of this kind of space between atoms. Um, and it wasn't even really until Plato and Aristotle that the, that particular equivocation uh, in terms of the word nothing and the idea of nothing was kind of deep enough understood uh, in and of itself uh, so that there was continually this problem of kind of 
yes, there are these atoms, and in between these atoms there's nothing, but, it, you know, again, there can't be nothing exists. Um, that, that would be kind of a, a, uh, a contradiction of terms in a certain sense, uh, going to the video on contradiction. So Aristotle kind of compared this view of things to, with in, in analogy, going back to the analogy video, to the alphabet. And that the atoms kind of represented something similar to the letters of the alphabet. And so you could have a you know, very big difference in the meaning of the word depending what letters or how the letters were arranged, even if they were the same letters. So for example, you could have the word NAND, going back to the NAND video. Or you could have something like you know, NA for not available. Two completely cromulent words, two completely you know, different arrangements of atoms, or, or of the atoms of the word or the, you know, the letters themselves. Uh, that's a simple analogy, but it, it, it actually kind of works. Uh, and it's worth pointing out that it kind of dates to around the time when Aristotle and Democritus were, were, were kind of going back and forth on it. Uh, he would have viewed atoms as things that are neither created nor destroyed. Again, this isn't actually true. Atoms, that in fact, do get created and destroyed. Uh, but it's an early attempt at putting cosmological invariants somewhere. And it wasn't, at the time, a bad guess. Uh, and most of the time, the atoms aren't uh, created and destroyed. Uh, but, of course, some of the time they are. Aristotle didn't like this idea because it didn't explain where atoms came from. And so it left this kind of open question of, okay, well, we have this kind of invariant universe that it seems to be configuring itself all the time. You know, yes, there's a tradition in Greek thought going up to him of a universe that's cyclic and that kind of has always existed, will always exist, and will just kind of continue to configure itself in different ways. Uh, I don't know if he particularly subscribed to that or not, but he certainly found evidence of it, uh, and so he would have viewed things in terms of that. Uh, in his lifetime, Aristotle was probably his chief critic, and Aristotle was a little bit younger than him, uh, so that he kind of had a head start on that. But even Aristotle respected him for his clear arguments for the nature of the universe and his sound reasoning, uh, his kind of understanding of things. This was a smart guy in Aristotle's time, and Aristotle knew it and kind of built on his work when thinking of his own ideas, even if some of Aristotle's ideas were kind of misguided and wrong uh, in relation to his. Uh, Descartes, as mentioned in the Descartes video, saw uh, or got his start in science and got his start in philosophy by considering Democritus' ideas. And so Democritus you know, would have got to a certain point and been able, unable to get further. Uh, but a couple thousand years later, uh, Descartes would have got, had access to the thinkers that had been thinking for quite some time, doing experiment for quite some time. And so Descartes would have seen the difference between qualities that were, were positive and negative. That is, you could have the lack of heat and you could feel it. So this is kind of a negative quality, a, something that you perceive but doesn't actually exist uh, except in relation to some other quality or some other quantity. And so he would have kind of viewed this in terms of atoms, uh, or, or at least to start with in terms of atoms. And if water was intrinsically blue, uh, his argument would be that ocean waves would not froth, that they would actually still be blue. And so there must be some part of water, there must be some component that water is made out of that can do different things depending how it's treated, or depending how it's moving, or depending what it, you know, regardless of what it's doing, uh, it's, there's, there's just these simpler things that water is made out of that behaves differently. Uh, and so there, there wasn't, as of Democritus, uh, a, an understanding of the conservation of momentum. So he would have had to have imagined how atoms interact with each other. So if you have two atoms, they get close to each other. Uh, what happens? We, you know, by his time, there wasn't this understanding that you know, if they behaved like billiard balls or something like that, that one would go one way, one would go the other in a per you know, particular uh, understandable way. Uh, he would have viewed them as flinging each other away from each other, as kind of interacting in a more complicated way, uh, but just in a way to make the whole thing work. So he didn't quite have a good idea of how that worked, but he was starting to get to the asking to the right questions. Um, unlike Descartes, and more like the pragmatists, go to the pragmatism video, uh, he wasn't uh, interested in doubting everything for the sake of doubting everything. Uh, he had his doubts, and in particular in regards to religion. Uh, he had rules for uh, accounting that for things that were 
you know, there wasn't really a method to his approach yet. So, you know, he was he was a pre-science thinker. He was a, someone who was kind of exposing himself to all the ideas of the day and trying to kind of make a consistent worldview from it. Uh, but there was no rhyme or reason to the ways that he came to conclusions to his ideas themselves. There were just kind of a lot of kind of things happening, um, cornucopia of ideas, as many as possible uh, in his mind, again, with the, the knowledge of the world, bought by a fortune, uh, a large fortune, uh, and the, a kind of mind that was willing to go out and look for it. This is what he could, could accomplish with that. Uh, you could accomplish more if you were more directed in a particular approach, uh, as we've explained and described in other videos. But again, he was before this. He, he would have kind of uh, existed in the time before had anyone had tried doing that. Uh, in relation to the epistemology and AI video, he would have considered there to be two kinds of knowledge, bastard knowledge and genuine knowledge. Uh, bastard knowledge was precept or perception or sense data, uh, especially images of reflections or perceptions of reflections. Uh, and then genuine knowledge would have been arrivable only through induction and reflection. Uh, and that you would ha have this knowledge of how the laws of the universe work, or at least some of the laws of the universe, that there are these laws that can be known, and then you use from that, and you take the, the experience that you have, and kind of you deduce or you induce some knowledge uh, about other laws. And so the, the, the game for him would have been to continue to learn the laws of the universe, that there are these things out there that govern how things move, how atoms move, that you can understand them, and that as you learn one law, it'll allow you to find the next law or the next laws, and so that there's this kind of understandable universe out there waiting for you to understand it, and that the way to understand it is to find out the laws that govern the interactions between atoms, the interactions between types of atoms, or, or at least the, the ways that things move in general, so that you can simplify large, complicated problems down to the level of movement, down to the level of springs, and how do springs work, down to the level of simple things like, you know, I don't know if levers were invented yet, but th this is around the time that they would have been. Uh, so again, if you can take, you know, if you're coming across a complicated situation, break it apart. See if you can understand it in terms of its simplest parts and build your way back up to an understanding of the whole system. And he would have taken on large, in addition to the very small problems of how atoms move. Uh, he would have put some thought into larger problems that perplex the smartest people of the world for thousands of years later. For example, searching for the Philosopher's Stone. Uh, he would have been one of those smart guys looking for that. Again, see the video on alchemy for more details on that. But, as kind of mentioned in the, the beginning of this video, he's the kind of thought to be the father of modern science because of this kind of view that there are these laws that can be known and that you can know them. So go look for these laws, go see if you can learn kind of ways of describing what actually happens without appealing to the kind of divine, without appealing to uh, causes and effects that you can't, by definition, understand. Uh, if you have any questions about Democritus, unfortunately, a, a lot of his work uh, has is lost to us, uh, but I can try to field uh, a, a, at least a little bit of questions about him. Uh, feel free to ask anywhere where this uh, video is posted. Uh, and as usual, there should be a Bitcoin donation address at the bottom here. And I should just point out, uh, I am intending to travel west uh, from beautiful Thunder Bay uh, in the next coming weeks. So if you're interested in meeting up, uh, maybe seeing a kind of one of these live or something like that, uh, again, leave a uh, email or something, uh, and uh, maybe we'll uh, arrange that. So hopefully you enjoy. See you next video.